What grace to be able to pen the words in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of grief, it is well with my soul. And what wisdom and what knowledge to understand that my sin, not in part, but the whole, all of it. Jacob mentioned to this week, or maybe it was last week, I don't remember, coming to an understanding that it wasn't just past sins, but present sins and future sins that were nailed under the cross of Jesus. He bore it all. I love getting good news. Anybody else? I love getting good news. Whether that's uh, the birth of a nephew or a niece, a great, great nephew or niece. You know, when one of my nephews and nieces have a child, that makes me a great uncle, but I already knew that. My dad joke did not go over very well. Okay. Moving Moving on. I love good news, but you know what? Sometimes there's bad news. Just two weeks ago, we got devastating news that a dear friend of ours had been killed in a car accident. That's hard. Just a week, couple weeks before that, Becky called me about her mom. It's hard. Bad news. There's bad news in the Bible. And the bad news is the state of humanity. But there's good news. Euangelion is the Greek word that means the gospel, the good news. And we talked about that last week. And in our memory verse, it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is God's power for salvation. To everyone who believes, everyone who believes, there is a qualification. It's not just to everyone, is it? It's to everyone who believes. To the Jew and to the Greek, not just to the Jew. That's to all nationalities, everyone who believes, no matter what their nationality, no matter what their origin. We have people in this room from all kinds of backgrounds, amen? You know what? God sees you all exactly the same, and so and so should we see each other, right? That's right. My my son-in-law, Zach Allen, is of Jewish heritage. I praise God for him. He doesn't get any special advantage over me who is a Gentile. Praise God! For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. God's righteousness demands payment for sin. And in the gospel, it's revealed that God in his righteousness sent his son to pay that payment for me. That's the good news. I'm guilty. I'm born guilty. I cannot plead innocence. I can't even plead not guilty. The evidence is overwhelming. But God, who is rich in mercy, sent his son. And it's revealed from faith to faith, revealed from faith to the one who exercises that faith. Romans, sometimes called the gospel according to Paul, has two stark things that are revealed in chapter 1. The first we've discussed, the righteousness of God in the gospel. The gospel revealed, but also we have the 
wrath of God revealed. I put this up last week. It is a seven part, seven point um, outline for the gospel. We're on number three. An analysis of the depravity of human beings and an explanation of the work of Christ as the provision for that need. How bad is man? How bad, how depraved. There are those that will teach you that we're bad, but we're not as bad as we can get. They're wrong. There are those that will teach you that everyone's born good, but we go bad. They're wrong. We believe, the Bi- and the Bible teaches, and Paul will explain in the next three chapters, that man is as bad as he can get. It's total and complete depravity. And another way to put that is called total inability. So because we're as bad as we can get, because we're dead in our trespasses and sins, we have no ability on our own to please God. Thank you. I'm glad you agree with that. We cannot in any way, in any fashion, please the living God whose righteousness is the standard and that standard is perfection. I already talked about that. In your Bibles, chapter 1 of Romans, verse 18, I encourage you to turn there. I will have the the verses on the screen, but i like you to see them in your own copies of God's Word if you have them. I put them on the screen more for Joyce than anybody else because it makes it easier for Joyce to follow along. Romans 1, verse 18, for God's Wrath is revealed. The first word you should notice is for. Paul is now contrasting the the revelation of God's righteousness and grace to those that place his righteousness to those that place faith in God's gospel and the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's contrasting that with the state of God's wrath upon those who do not believe. God's righteousness is revealed to those who do believe and given to them, but God's wrath is revealed from heaven. Present, passive, indicative in the Greek. What on earth does that mean, Pastor Tim? A present is an ongoing action. It's not an aorist of one-time thing. God's wrath is being revealed and continues to be revealed and will continue to be revealed from heaven against in the scriptures we find God's wrath in a number of places in Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 20 it says therefore this is what the Lord says look my anger my burning wrath is about to be poured out upon this place on man and beast, on the tree of the uh, on the tree of the field, and on the produce of the land, my wrath will burn and will not be quenched. Next time I hear somebody say, "Oh, a loving God wouldn't do that," they don't know Scripture. Do we believe our feelings, or do we believe what the Word of God says? John three, the one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who refuses to believe in the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. Ephesians 5, 6, no, let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Revelation 4, 9 through 11. third angel followed them and spoke with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast in his image, receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, for he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, which is mixed full strength in the cup of his anger and so forth. Wrath is not foreign to scripture. God's wrath is righteous. God's wrath is right. God's wrath perfectly for 
fits in with his attributes, when we only teach the God of love, which God is, amen, and we forget that there's a God, that God is also a God of righteousness, and righteousness demands wrath, we have done a disservice to those who study the scripture and want to know God. God's wrath is revealed from heaven against God's wrath is not evil anger. I can be angry at people. In fact, for many years, and I won't say that I've ever fully overcome it, I've had a pretty bad temper. Samantha could probably tell you stories of when I lost my cool. And you know what? Almost no time was I angry righteously. It was sin. And I have struggled to overcome that sin and to deal with that like anybody else. Amen? You can call it my German thick-headedness or something else, but really it just needs to be called sin. God's wrath is not sin. God's wrath is righteous. God's wrath is not malice or a desire to be hurtful to somebody. You ever wanted to just I remember sitting with my father-in-law one time and he had this problem member in his church who was just just a pain in the neck. And he said to me, I just sometimes want to punch him right in the face. This sweet little David Shemp took me kind of aback. I've never quite saw that side of him. The desire, the malice to just want to hurt somebody because of how they've hurt you. God's wrath is not malice. What is it? It's an expression of his attribute. His attribute of justice and righteousness. It is an expression of who he is. It is just and righteous. In Romans 2, 5, it says, because of the hardness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath. When God's righteous judgment is revealed. You see, we should fear it. We were discussing this morning. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Too many churches have made fear into reverential awe. Oh, we should just be in awe. No, we should be afraid. Because God is almighty and he's the judge of all the earth. We should be shaking in our boots. Shouldn't we? This is the one that can, can take our life. They can bring judgment. And we have no fear. God's wrath is punishment for sin. Righteous punishment. But in the midst of bad news, there's always good news. God's wrath is satisfied in Jesus Christ. My little children, I'm writing to you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does, he has a lawyer, an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the propitiation. Don't you love that word? In English, pastor, the satisfaction of God's wrath for our sin. He himself is the satisfaction in his own body, in him, his own person. He is the satisfaction. And not for ours. And he's talking about the Jewish people here only, but for the whole world, Jew and Gentile alike. Who then is God's wrath focused on? Well, it says here, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people. God's wrath will not rest on the sin, but on the sinner, my friends. 
I've heard it many say, many times say, well, God hates the sin but loves the sinner. You know who's going to stand under judgment for all eternity for their sins? Not the sin themselves, but for the sinner. Amen? God's wrath is poured out on the sinner. Don't forget it. God's love provides a way out. But God's wrath exists on the sinner against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. These are godless. My goodness. How many people today are godless? Unrighteous. We've got a lot of religious people that live in our community. A lot of religious people. Mostly Eastern religion. And you know, they're mean to each other. They, they, they're, they are not kind. They are not loving. They fight. They say terrible things about each other. They're not righteous. They don't know Jesus. They're religious. They may not be godless in that they worship something, but everyone worship something. They suppress or hold down the truth. You know, I think in the last 40 years, we have seen more suppression of the truth than in the previous 6,000. It's a pretty big statement. But there is a huge suppression of truth going on in the public arena. People don't want to hear. They don't want to know the truth. They to, to suppress means to prevent somebody from doing something by restraining or hindering, to prevent, to hinder, to restrain, or to keep from happening. This is the object. This is who God's wrath is revealed against. Why? Well, because, verse 19, or since, it's this word that has this idea of this is the reason. Why is God's wrath revealed against these people? Because the knowledge of God is in evidence. Enter the courtroom. Had some courtroom drama in the news this week, right? Into the courtroom. What's in evidence? God's righteous wrath is righteous because the very evidence that people need to convict them is already in evidence. Knowledge. When Paul talks about a knowledge of God made plain to human beings, he does not, he does in this text, as he does in this text, it is the general or natural revelation, not specific scriptural revelation that he has in mind. The concept that he need, that needs to be defined here is knowledge of God. This is necessary because the word to know or knowledge can be used in different ways. I have taught you that most of the time when you see the word K-N-O-W in scripture, what we're talking about is relational. Adam knew his wife. No, no, we know Marcy. Zach, we know Marcy. We're fine. He didn't know you, Marcy. It's fine. Welcome. Glad to see you. So what does the word knowledge mean in this context? Well, it can be, it can mean awareness to be aware of the existence of something. That is not a personal relationship. That doesn't involve me personally. I am aware of the existence of Mount Kilimanjaro. We did a VBS with it. Look, it was great. I've never been there. I have no personal knowledge. I have no personal awareness. I simply know that it exists someplace in Africa. That's what we're talking about there. Or knowing about goes a step 
further here. Knowledge here may be detailed, extensive, even important to know about something, um, to have studied. I tell you, sometimes my children call me a wealth of useless knowledge because I know a lot about, a lot, uh, I know a little about a lot of things. And there's a few things that I know a lot about, right? That'd be that kind of knowledge. Experience. Referring to something or some kind of knowledge that has been acquired by experience. Jim worked on my car Friday. Got it running. Praise God, my old car, my Buick. And he had to draw on his experience, experiential knowledge of old engines, to figure out what on earth was wrong with this thing because it made no sense. We fixed several different things that didn't work. It turned out to be a bad wire. And it's running. We took it for a long drive. You missed out. Zach got to drive. Uh, not drive, ride. He, I'm not letting him drive till he's 40. Personal knowledge. The highest and most important level. This is personal or relational. That's what oftentimes it means in Scripture. That idea of a relational experience knowledge. In the context of our text, says Boyce, by the way, this is from James Montgomery Boyce. This is not personal, relational, or experiential. This is basic awareness. Nature reveals God in such a way that men and women are at least aware that God exists and that they should worship him. The most basic level of awareness is in evidence against them that they should understand that there is a God and that they should be worshiping. God has revealed it to them through his creation. I always wonder how a medical doctor that has studied the complexities of the human body can ever, ever, ever believe that there wasn't a God that designed it. Just, just think about how the systems within your body interact and what it takes for the cells to produce energy, to cause the muscles to contract, to what it takes for the synapses in your brain to remember something. It shouldn't happen. And it certainly couldn't happen by some evolutionary process. It is a greater chance that an explosion in a junkyard will produce a brand new Cadillac than that evolution would ever happen. That's, that's my, uh, my go-to. They are without excuse because... He has revealed through his creation. What did he reveal? He revealed his eternal power. You know, we've lost something. We uh, like to go out and get in the hot tub in the backyard and look up at the stars. And we can count maybe seven or eight. We've lost something because of the lights of the city. The awesomeness of God's creation is lost because we've drowned it out. His divine nature. The, the idea is that God, there is a God and that, there, that he is a supreme being. That there is a divinity we should be worshiping. He says as a result, they are without excuse. If I can put it in a courtroom sense, they are without a defense. There is nothing they can say to defend themselves because the evidence is overwhelming. There's nothing left to say. Because they knew God and didn't glorify Him, did not give thanks. They began to think in vainly nonsense interesting here it says 
For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became. Their thinking became nonsense. That word became is passive. It's aorist passive. It's an action in the past done to them. Not done by them. Passive means that, uh, you know, the verb something happens to me. I didn't do something. Well, they began to think nonsensical because of their position of having rejected God. They were made to think nonsense. Is it not nonsense what we hear today? Some of them, some, some people say about creation, about God. Their minds are, were darkened, also passive. They became fools, claiming to be wise, also passive. They became idol worshipers, making a God in their own image. Oh, this is no longer passive. It says, they exchanged the glory of God, of the immortal God, for images revealing mortal men, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. And in verse 25, and they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, worshiped and served something created instead of the creator who is praised forever. Amen. This is active. No longer is it something being done to them. It is something being done by them. What are they doing? Who is this? This is the people who the wrath of God is on. This is unbelievers, people that have not placed faith in Jesus Christ. Well, what's the result? Because of all this. Because of what he just said. Because of their actions. Because of their thinking. Because of their rejection. God did something. God gave them up. Also an active verb. It means to turn them over or to stop restraining. Warren Wiersbe said it this way. God revealed his wrath. By not sending fire from heaven, but not by sending fire from heaven, by abandon. Let me start that over because I'm going too fast. God revealed his wrath, not by sending fire from heaven, but by abandoning sinful men to their lustful ways. And he begins to describe it. God delivered them over to the craving of their heart, to sexual immorality, impurity, to their, so their bodies were degraded among themselves. I call this runaway lust. My stars, my friends, is that not the world we live in? Runaway lust. There is a lust for sexual pleasure. There is a lust for, for um, wealth relaxation, to get away on vacation, to do anything that pleases me. Judges 1, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did. It was right in his own eyes. My goodness. Isn't that what we hear all the time? Well, if that's right for you. But my truth, whoa. This isn't about everybody doing what's right in his own eyes. There's standards, and the standard is God's righteousness, is it not? Genesis 6, verse 5. When the Lord saw that man's wickedness was widespread on the earth, and that every scheme his mind thought of was nothing but evil all the time. This is describing the days of Noah. Every scheme his mind thought of was nothing but evil all the time. Matthew 24, verse 36. Now concerning that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, except the Father only, as the days of Noah was, so will the Son, the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, is that not today? Could Jesus come back today for his church? Yeah. Because we are living in the days as the days of Noah was. Doesn't mean he is. 
We don't know. Because no one knows. That's what it says. Don't start pretending somebody knows. And these people that na name a date, they're in violation of Scripture. Amen? So don't go there. But he could come back today. Impurity. Filth. Dirt. Rubbish. He gave them over to impurity, to be degraded, treated with disrespect, to cause to be dishonored, to be treated shamefully. Exchanging natural relationships for unnatural ones. Going against nature. This is why gave them, God gave them over to degrading passions, even their females engaged in immorality. I'm not going to read it. You read it. It's disgusting to even read what Paul wrote. Not that Paul was disgusting, but what he is describing is what this world is doing. It's describing lesbianism and homosexuality and all these other sinful actions that should not be called moral. And yet our world says this is good. Because we're calling good, evil, and evil good. He gives a list here. Because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God. He delivered their worthless mind to doing what is morally wrong. Romans 1, they are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, malice. This list, evil, doing, doing evil deeds, greed, desiring what another has, wickedness.
Sorry about that online. We got it fixed. We've got it fixed. We're back online. Although they know full well that God's just sentence to those that practice such things deserve death. My friends, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And the wages of sin is death. We all deserve it. Now, we're not talking about physical death. We deserve that. And we're all, we will all face physical death. But this is talking about spiritual death. This is talking about eternal death. This is talking about eternal separation from God in a place where, that Christ described as a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, that there is torment for all eternity. And although they have an idea that the those that practice such things deserve death, they do it anyway. And the end of the verse, verse 32, not only do they do them, but they applaud others who practice them. We have people cheering on evil. Do we not? And condemning those that say it's wrong. Now, let me, let me be very clear about something. The good news of the gospel is the, is the answer. Not fixing their evil. The good news of the gospel is the remedy for a person who has just been described because the gospel is, what's our verse? The power of God for salvation. It is the gospel that's revealed, been revealed in order to remedy those that practice such things. My friends, we should not get in the face of those that practice sexual immorality and say, you need to stop what you're doing. We need to get in their face and say, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. There's, there's a penalty coming. And the only way to escape Death, eternal death, is to place faith in Jesus Christ. There's wickedness in this world, and we should expect it. And when we deal with somebody who's living lifestyles that we know are opposed to God, I need you to think they need Jesus, not they need to stop what they're doing. With Jesus, will they stop what they're doing? Yeah. <laughs> but the answer isn't trying to please God by changing their moral behavior. Because they won't. They won't change their moral behavior and they won't please God. And I don't care how moral a person it is. My good friend and neighbor, Don Dreisbach, I believe died without Christ. He was one of the nicest, most moral people I've ever met. That didn't get him saved that doesn't get him to heaven because he never placed faith in Jesus Christ accepting the good news that has been revealed from heaven to us. And that good news is Jesus Christ paid that penalty that we cannot pay. God cannot Ignore sin. God cannot just say, you don't have to pay that. Because that would be a violation of his righteousness. But God did provide a way, did he not? Through the cross of Calvary, Jesus, the righteous one, paid our price. And through faith in him, We can spend eternity with God. You know, we don't live in an easy world. But God is with us. 
James says, if you ask, if you need wisdom, let ask of God. Maybe you're dealing with a tough situation. We have a number of them that I'm aware of. Difficult situations at work or family. God is there with you. If you've placed faith in him, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I will give you the wisdom that you need. Sometimes we need to be reminded from whence we came. If you're a Christian, if you believe in Jesus Christ, this was you. And you have not attained righteousness of your own. You have been given the righteousness that was revealed, and that is in Jesus Christ. And we praise God for that. Father, we thank you that we can look and say, but for the grace of God, that's me. And because of the grace of God, that's not me anymore. Thank you for your gift, your free gift of salvation. And help us, Father, to embrace it and to share it with others that they may come to understand who you are and your gift to them. In Jesus' name.